so um, I believe most of you here know who I am. Uh, but for those of you who don't, my name is Livia Newbert, and I serve uh, BCC as um, its ESL program coordinator. I also teach a couple of classes here, and I see a lot of my students in attendance today. Um, I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, on behalf of Chad Agatsenko and myself, uh, we've collaborated on uh, this project. Um, and so we're very excited to have all of you here today. I want to thank our panelists um, for volunteering to do this. Um, so we're very excited about this opportunity because this gives our students a chance to make their voices heard and hopefully initiate change, which is ultimately our goal with this project. Um, the idea of this project we named Student Voices is to educate and enlighten. I love that word, enlighten. We want our students to feel a stronger sense of belonging here at BCC. And for that to happen fully, we need to be open and we need to want to learn more about who they are as individuals and as a member of this community college. Um, we all need to be open to accepting the fact that the world has changed and is changing as we speak before our eyes. And things that seemed to work 20 years ago don't work anymore today. Things that were accepted 20 years ago are not accepted anymore today. So it's only by educating ourselves and actively listening to their stories that we can successfully respond to their needs and that we'll be able to find ways in which we can make their time here at BCC more enjoyable and their journey successful. Not knowing cannot be an excuse anymore. So without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our moderator for this panel, Professor Eduardo Triff. I was very brief. Jesus. Uh, thank you, Professor Newbert, and to Chad Argusinger for the Student Voices Project. Uh, and hello, my name is Soren Triff, or, or the long version is Eduardo Soren Triff. And I'm an associate professor of Spanish and coordinator of the Spanish English Community Interpreting Certificate Program here at Bristol. Uh, I would like to introduce this panel uh, by first saying some things about me and a Hispanic, as a Hispanic Latino professional and, and later about the students. This is the first time in 14 years at the college that I've been invited to a college-wide activity. And uh, this activity is related to race, ethnicity. This tells you a little bit about invisibility. One way to discriminate you, to eliminate you, is by making you invisible. Yes, you are allowed to be here, but you don't have a safe environment where you can contribute to your community beyond the place assigned to you by society. I accepted the invitation because of my students, but some of them here in the panel today. This is not a good time to be a Hispanic Latino in the United States. Federal authorities can question United States citizens in the streets of America about your legal status at any time. And if you cannot prove that you are an American, they can certainly detain you uh, with no other explanation than suspicions that you are an illegal alien. The Lat Hispanic Latino students who are sharing their experience with you today are really brave to uh, present themselves in a public space to teach us what it is like to be a Hispanic Latino in our community. I decided to be here because I want to share the same risks my students are facing by being here today. Why is it important to listen to uh, Hispanic Latino experiences? It is important because we need to know our neighbor. I'm thinking here about, you know, that phrase from the Bible, know your neighbor, well, my translation of the, of the phrase. And what happened is that our neighbor, our neighbor used to be like us. As a matter of fact, 
2,000 years ago, my neighbor was my family. But today, our neighbors are not our family necessarily, right? It's more and more different. So we need uh, to know our neighbor. Our neighbor is today, uh, in order to succeed in life, and our neighbor is today our boss, our client, our employee. Our neighbor is no longer a member of our families. A person who like, is like us, who thinks like us, who looks like us, uh, it is a matter of survival for us as a community, as a nation, and as a civilization to understand and learn how to work with people who are different than us. You are going to learn today about Hispanic Latino female students, what it is like to be in their shoes. There is not a place called Latino or Hispanic. There is not a country like that, OK? It is a label given by the government uh, to make sense of people who don't fit in under other labels. Uh, you will learn that Latinos are from different countries, different cultural backgrounds, different social classes, and different color of skin, among all the many other things. As you listen to their stories, you will see that they are not so different to the stories of many of us, that we are being struggling with the same things, that we are all humans solving the same problems. I think that that is the idea of this uh, uh, Student Voices project, to see the human in other, in an, in other person who does not look like us, who does not think like us in, in, in the surface, right? I'm sure that you are going to learn that lesson today. I thank again the panel uh, of brave Hispanic Latino female students for teaching us today what it's like to be a Hispanic in our community. And I please ask you to give a round of applause to the, our panels, please. <laughs> brave, brave women today here with us. And now we'll present the, the panelists. Uh, the, the way we're going to work is by uh, letting each uh, presenter tell the story. And I will go from, from to my right, from here to the, to the end. And after that, then we're going to have then a, a ask session, you know, question answer uh, uh, session. So um, to my, to, directly next to my, to my right, I have Rosa Rios. Next is Sara Incapié. Uh, follows uh, Laura Martinez. I will introduce them one by one later, okay? But I want you to get the names. After Laura Martinez, we have uh, Manuela Yepes. Uh, after that, uh, Lais Vargas. And at the end of the table uh, is Kerlin Levesque. Two of them are students in my Spanish-English interpreting program. That's why I'm here supporting them today. So we... Anything else to say? So let's I give the word to, to Rosa Rios. Hi, good morning. Uh, good afternoon, rather. Uh, my name is Rosie Rios. I am native born in Puerto Rico, uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I was a very young mother. Um, I had three children. And during my formative years, I kind of dedicated myself to raising my children. And I didn't go to college. So during my formative years, I was pretty much raising my children. Um, my oldest two already graduated um, college. Uh, they're in their late 20s. And my youngest one started college last year. She's 19. Um, so um, upon raising my daughters and being done with that task, um, I always had regrets about not going to, to school and pursuing higher education. So once my youngest daughter was off and ready to go to college, I decided that perhaps I should reconsider going back to school. So while I was at the Career Center in Fall River during a layoff period of my job, I actually inquired about um, some job training programs and someone from Bristol Community College was there um, to speak about um, some of the programs that they had available. Um, and I was looking through a lot of the things that they had and because of my age, I don't have the luxury of many, many years um, like a lot of young folks to dedicate to higher education. So I was trying to look for something that would fit my schedule, um, the time that I had, and also the skill set that I'd already um, gained throughout the years um, working in, the, in you know, my 20 years plus experience in the, uh, in the corporate world. So um, looking through the stuff, I found the interpreting program um, at BCC for Spanish and, uh, interpreter in the community. And since I already had um, 
the knowledge of Spanish, which was my first language, I figured that I would uh, best serve myself using something, a skill set that I already had, which was my language. Um, every single job that I had here in the United States, most of them have been because of my bilingual skill set. So I figured that in order to expand on that and to make myself more marketable, um, I would just go with the interpreting program because it's a resource that I didn't have to learn. I already had it as a natural thing. Um, it was my first language. So I inquired about it within the uh, college. I met with Professor Triff many times to get everything in order, um, in order to be ready for the fall. So um, at the same time that my daughter, my youngest daughter, who was 19 last year, was starting college, I was starting college myself. Um, and I've decided to pursue that so that I can expand my career and actually have a career since all of the years that I have been working, I've been pretty much um, someone who's just picked up everything on the job and doesn't really have a job title. So now I can feel like I've accomplished something and not raising my children, just only raising my children, but also accomplishing something for myself that I can feel proud of. Thank you for your time. Next is Sara Incapié. Hola, how's everybody? Uh, thank you so much for coming here today. Um, my name is Sara Incapié. I'm an engineering transfer student here at Bristol Community College. I'm also the president of the STEM club and I am the current student trustee on the board of trustees. So I wanted to share my story today, which I hope will um, resonate with some of you. It has a theme of family. Uh, you will see there's a lot of sacrifice and it, it was also a lot of self-discovery. So my family's immigration story begins when I was about two years old. Um, there was a, by the time that I was born it was four siblings, so three older brothers and myself, the one and only woman in the family. And I remember even when I was very little, um, there was a lot of water shortages. And even though I was too young to remember any of it, um, my brothers have told me that they would be out in the streets uh, begging for food. So that's the situation that we were in at the time. And it, it was interesting because even though my father was the chief of firemen in our community, it was still a lot of poverty. So just to give you an image of the situation. so. In a leap to improve our family situation, my father packed his bags, talked to my mother, and he said that he was gonna come to the United States. So he came here when I was two years old, and I only had a picture of him to actually remember him by. So that was how things got started. Uh, once my father got here, he actually was homeless. He through the kindness of a stranger, he ended up acquiring a van. So he was living in a van for a while, and in his, during his jobs as a, in a supermarket and grocery stores, he would actually sleep in the attic, um, and then in the morning he'd clean up, make sure nobody knew he was there, and then go right back to work the next day. So during his beginning of the years, um, he was incredibly lonely, and despite all the hardships, he still found a way to somehow send money home to our family to provide for us. Um, down the line, my parents eventually divorced while my father was still in the country. Um, my dad still had a profound love for his children, so he kept sending money to us. He kept uh, calling the house. And then he met my stepmother, who I will share her story in a little bit, but she's a woman that mostly shaped who I am today. So back in Colombia, while my dad was going through his hardships, um, you can imagine that there was constant talk about the United States. Many of you are probably familiar with it, um, the American dream, how amazing that once you step to this country, um, you immediately become uh, rich, but obviously that's not the case, and my father's story can tell you of that. So in 2005, I remember I was little, I was very excited, and we went to the capital, and my family my brother and I got our passports. So again, there was four children. Um, two of them were already over the age of 18, and two of us were under the age of 18. So what happened was two of my brothers were denied their first time, and the other said, myself and one of my older brothers, we were given the opportunity to come to the United States. So in December 2005, my dad came to Colombia, and when I was eight years old, that was the first time I ever met my father. 
and it's just incredible um, how you feel that amount of love through the phone calls, through the pictures. So the first day I saw him at the airport, I just knew I, by instinct I ran over and hugged him. And so I came here, I turned eight years old, and then I started um, attending an ESL program, an elementary school over in Taunton at the Galligan Elementary School. And I, you could say that for me there was a push to learn English as quickly as I could, and I wanted to assimilate as soon as possible. So this is where the self-discovery comes in. So I really, once I learned English, I, I loved writing, I loved writing to express myself, so I believe that's really what helped me learn my English in the six months that I very quickly learned it in. Um, by the end of third grade, I was the best speller and the best writer in my class, and which was unusual for an immigrant student. But despite being a good writer, I was failing a lot of classes. I didn't really have as much of a drive for education, which I didn't find out until um, I was much older that the reason my father brought us here was to be educated. So through my teachers, they contacted my parents, they contacted my stepmother, and they let her know, hey, your child is, she's a great writer, um, she's very brilliant, but she's failing her classes, what's going on. So she, my mom sat me down and she asked me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And when I was younger, I thought, well, I, I guess I'm just going to take care of my family and be a stay-at-home mom. And then she looked at me and she says, do you have any idea how much opportunity there is in this country? And you're, I understand you're a woman, but oh my gosh, you're the most beautiful thing. And after that, I became more serious about my studies. After I learned about the sacrifices my father went through, I wanted to make sure that it didn't disappoint him, so I became much more serious about it. Um, even though I had to repeat third grade, when I went to fourth grade, I graduated the ESL program, and I went to school in um, a very English community, so there was not a lot of diversity. And that's where the self-discovery was coming, because I was trying to become someone that I wasn't. So here was um, the Spanish woman, Spanish girl back then, with, an, with a really heavy Spanish accent. Um, people, I kept getting bullied or questioned for who, for being Spanish. It was a community that had so much bias towards the Spanish. And as a little girl, I could feel it. So a lot of the times, I, I would stay after school, I would go home to my mom, and I'd make sure that I, would get, I got rid of my accent. That's what I was trying to make sure of. And eventually, I started lying to kids about um, who I was. I wouldn't even mention that I was Spanish. I pretended that I grew up here the whole entire time. And it brought on more bullying, because kids eventually, they realize who you really are. Um, but at the end of the year, again, it was through my professors and my teachers, they sat me down and they told me, why are you hiding it? Why are you pretending that you're not, that you're not who you are? So unfortunately, at the end of fourth grade, um, my stepmother and my father got divorced. So that started a, a very rough chapter in my life. But right after that, I went back to my country and that's when it hit me really hard that I was trying to get rid of my roots. So I went to my country in 2009. I met my mother again. And what was weird was I could understand Spanish, but I forgot how to make sentences. So picture a uh, mother and daughter that grew up eight years of the young daughter's life. And here I am trying to draw to communicate with her because it was us trying so hard to learn English that we didn't speak any Spanish those three years. Um, from 2005 to 2009. So that was a big hit. Eventually, at the end of the summer, I remembered uh, my Spanish again, and I came back with a stronger sense of who I was, of my pride. I was really proud of being Spanish, and that's when I realized it. And I wanted to continue improving my Spanish. So I came back, and we moved, because of the divorce, to a more diverse community. We went to Taunton. And through middle school and high school, my father had two jobs. He was a single father trying to raise his two children, trying to provide for them. So 
it was a lot of just seeing him for about an hour of the day. And of course, as many of the women here would understand in Latino culture, when you're the woman in the family, no matter how old or how young you are, you have to cook for everybody, you have to clean, take care of the house. So from 10 years old, I was already cooking full-fledged meals, uh, taking care of my older brother, which might sound strange, but that's what the culture's all about. And my, I was trying really hard to balance that, trying really hard to also be my own self-advocate. Um, as a first-generation student, my father didn't understand how the grading system worked. He didn't understand um, how W-2 forms work, how to apply for financial aid, all those things. So it was a lot of me trying to like reach out to strangers, reach out to my instructors and say, hey, please help me because no one in my family knows how this works. Um, by sophomore year, that's when I became very ill, trying to balance everything out. And my professors ended up contacting my father saying that your daughter is not feeling well, we can see that. Um, so my father sat down with me, he asked me what was wrong, and I started crying, I told him, Dad, I, there's just so much I'm trying to balance, I'm trying to be the perfect woman that you want me to be, while I'm trying to go through my education because I want us as a whole family, not just myself, just my whole family, I wanted to learn and really be educated for a better future. So my dad did the most amazing thing, he understood it, and from that point onward, he started helping around the house, started cooking, started telling my brother, hey, don't just treat her as the woman anymore. She is your sister. She is one of your partners in this life, so help her out. Um, and that was a huge um, culture meets the present world moment for us, where we were realizing what kind of country we lived in, the opportunities that were available, and that to be a successful family, um, we, we had to let go of that part of the culture. So after that, I started becoming more involved in my studies. I joined multiple clubs, participated in science fairs, um, went through honors classes, and then I graduated um, with honors. But um, something I want to share from my 16th birthday that some of the women here might find really, I don't know how to say, beautiful, and I can say, um, with all honesty, the best gift I've ever gotten in my life was my 16th birthday. Um, my dad wasn't able to make it to my quinceanera. I was spent it with my family, but my 16th birthday, he pulled me into a hug and he said, I hope God continues to bless you with a shining intelligence. And for a Latina woman to hear that from her father, that is the most incredible and most empowering thing that she can hear that your father is supporting you and telling you, you don't have to, I'm sorry, it's emotional, you don't have to abide to that stigma or that standard that your culture is putting on you. And now here I am today, I'm a first generation high school graduate, I'm a first generation college student, um, and I'm the first engineer in my family out of um, the men and the woman, and I, can't get any help from my brothers in my math assignments, um, but they try in every way that they can to help me. Another thing I want to share is 13 years later, um, just about a year ago, I got reunited with my oldest brothers. Their visas finally got approved, so that's another thing about immigration. Not only is there a lot of sacrifice, like you saw on my dad's side, sacrifice for me trying to sacrifice my culture, trying to assimilate, um, but you also, the sacrifice of not being able to be with the people that you love. And that's why 13 years later, it is, I want to share that, that one thing that immigrants all have in common is that whole set of sacrifices. You sacrifice that time to be with your family. Could be many, many years later, but now you're with your family again. Um, and then just to wrap it up, even though I may not look like it, um, something I do want people to take away from this is look to your left, look to your right, look at your neighbor. You never really know who this person is or where they are from. The other thing is here was a student that was failing who really had no initiative for 
uh, receiving an education um, and throughout my many professors, my mother, what they taught me was that you can only fail if you don't try. And to this day, I keep in touch with all my teachers. Um, I'm also keeping in touch with my stepmother, who taught me that the biggest obstacle in your life is yourself. And that's something that I really hope uh, resonates with the rest of you today. All right, and that is it. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, next is uh, Laura Martinez. Good afternoon, everybody. I am happy today. My name is uh, Sister Laura Martinez. I am from Colombia, South America. I have lived in the United States for one year. My parents passed away a long time ago, and I will always miss them. I have three brothers and three sisters. I am the youngest. All are married, and I have 25 nieces and nephews. It's a big and beautiful family. I am a member of the Congregation of Dominican Sisters of the Presentation. This congregation is a Catholic religious community that is a present in 36 countries and four continents. Today I am real happy because Sara and Manuela study in Colombia in schools than in, me, in my congregation. It's a beautiful, for, for me, it's a goal, good for, it's good representation for the education in my community. My community is present in 36 countries and four continents. We work in a school, hospitals, and social service. I study in BCC because my congregation for more than 20 years have sent sisters to many countries, for example, Colombia, Vietnam, Iraq, Jordan, India, Mexico, and other here at BCC to learn or improve English. The Dominican sister experience has been very positive. According to the sister who have studied here, Bristol Community College ran A+. Thank you very much. Yes, the, the next, next speaker is, is Manuela Yepes, also from Colombia, am I right? Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Manuela. I'm from Colombia. I'm 22 years old. Uh, I have been here for almost three years by myself. I got married in 2015. Um, it's a challenge for me because I never cook before, I never clean before, I never do anything. <laughs> but for me, I took the decision because um, I'm a dreamer and I think that come here is uh, the best opportunity for me because I, my dream is one day be a doctor and many people, not many, all, everyone tell me, no, you can do it. That never, never happened. And I think if you can dream, you can do it. For me, it's, it's a good opportunity to be here, but it's, it's crazy because I'm here by myself. I don't have friends, some friends. I don't have family, I don't have nobody. When I came here for the first time, I don't speak 
English, no any word, no, just hello, that's it. When I go to the restaurant, I can order food, I can speak with anybody. So I feel comfortable with being an immigration student in this place and I feel protected and I have never feel discriminated in this school. But I think that as immigrants, we have many disadvantages. In many cases, people can see us like inferior and make us feel so bad because we don't speak perfect English or we have a different accent. My accent is so hard. And we have a different cultures, different means, and also plays an important role in this case. Many people can see us very different or simple don't accept us because we dress different from the American culture. And I choose VCC because I feel safe in this place. And I think everyone helped me, the staff, tutors, everyone gonna help me and gonna, I feel comfortable for be here and I feel so happy that I have this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Lais Vargas uh, is going to be next. So hi, my name is Lais, and I am from the Dominican Republic. So, <laughs> sorry, I just have almost two years in the United States. Um, when I came to the United States, I didn't know to say anything. I just know to say like, hi, my name is Lais. I am 18 years old in that moment. And when I was in the like restaurant and something like that, I was like, do you speak Spanish? Do, do you know somebody speaks Spanish? Or, okay, we don't have somebody speak Spanish. And I was like, okay, can I have, and I say the name Ron, you know? When I was in my first interview to get a job, I asked, of course, to the manager, do you have somebody speak Spanish? I don't know speak Spanish. And he said, yes, we have somebody speak Spanish. Then I talked with him, and when I got the job, I only speak with him just with him. When was his day off, I was like silent. <laughs> I don't, I didn't talk with nobody. And when I was with him, one co-worker said, uh-uh, speak English. You are in the United States. So when I have to came to New Bedford, he said to me, if you have the opportunity to learn English, do it. If you have the opportunity to go to the college, do it. You don't lose nothing, just learn English. Now, one year later, was my first semester at BCC in New Bedford. I was talking in English, I was understood, everything the teacher said to me, and I passed my whole classes with A. So, that's it. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. The last panelist is uh, Kelly Levesque. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, I always think, uh, when somebody asks me, who are you? you know, or can you, like, when you go to a class and people, the, the professor asks you to introduce yourself, tell everyone who you are and, and, and why you're here. And I always wonder, you know, how, okay, who am I? You know, you, it's very common that when somebody asks that question, 
you first say, oh, I, it, your title or what you do or where you come from, but is that really who you are? Is that really the answer? So that is, that is very interesting and it's something that perhaps you want to think about as well. It's like, who, who are you? And um, we go through many circumstances. We go, yes, through uh, many achievements in life. We earn positions and uh, pass many challenges, but that does not, any, sometimes there are really bad situations that you go through, but that does not define who you are. That is just something that you get to do, something that you get to experience. And uh, the key thing is all those experiences, does, while they do not define who you are, they do shape who you become. So one important thing is to identify who is that who you want to become and what are the things that you need to do in order to get there. So who am I? <laughs> Okay, as Professor Triff said, I am Carolyn Levac. Uh, although I was born as Kerlin Ramirez Gonzalez in Venezuela, I won't tell you what year that was. And uh, I came to for the first time to the United States when I was nine years old. And uh, my mom and my auntie they did sort of an exchange. My cousin went there and uh, to live with my mother in Venezuela for one year. She learned perfect Spanish. So my mother did the same thing with me. So I lived with my auntie in Fall River uh, when I was nine years old, and uh, that's how I learned English. I went back to Venezuela, went through college, jobs, and then after a mudslide that we had in 1999, December 1999, everything changed. So uh, I decided to freshen up. I need something uh, just to let pass of that experience, and I came on vacation of, with uh, my family. Well, I went back to Venezuela, quit my job, picked, my, <laughs> picked up my, my luggage, and uh, decided to spend six months here in the United States. Well, in that period, I went to monster.com, applied for a job with a company uh, here in the United States. They did the sponsorship for me, and that's how I ended up uh, here. <laughs> now, after about two decades of working, uh, being a career woman, a lot of things uh, happened while I got married, had children, and uh, once those babies were born, I did not want to go back to work 50, 60 hours and for somebody else. So that's when the search began. Okay, what do I want, what do I want to do? Okay, I need to... Uh, I, I want to be able to contribute for, you know, with my family and, and uh, at the same time I want the flexibility to, to do both, be with my family and earn an income. And uh, I did many things and, and you know, nothing was quite fitting what I was looking for and um, it was uh, until <laughs> some sort of uh, blessing in disguise situation. My mother, my parents came on vacation in 2014 and my mother ended up in the hospital because she broke her hip. So there was this woman that came in to interpret for my mother. And as, I don't know if you're aware, but family members are no longer allowed to interpret for on the medical field. So this uh, women uh, came and I was so fascinated with not only the quality of her work, because of course I was screening every word she was saying to make sure that she was interpreting correctly, but her, her warmth, how, how she cared, that sparked an interest for me. It was like, hmm, this is something that perhaps I could do. And then that's where it, it, it began. It was this is a. It was. It was a no-brainer for me. I already had the language skill. I had. Uh, I liked to help people. I was interpreting all my life since I learned uh, how to speak English, uh, in at school, at work. 
and <laughs> between my family and my husband's family, of course, that was interpreting all the time, and that that's. Uh, Again, it was a win-win situation. I can do what I like, but I can do something that I'm capable of doing and uh, making a living out of it. And how did I get here? Well, uh, there were there are many, many, uh, th there weren't much information. There wasn't much information about, okay, where, where, where do I do? Excuse me. And uh, there were two places, but I ended up coming here because not only the reputation of the BCC, but also the location. I live in Taunton, so the location was fine with all the, the, the different uh, branches. And uh, I, till today, I, I believe that was the best decision that I could have taken. It, it was the experiences that I have gone through here, not only uh, ed, at the, on the educational uh, aspect, uh, but also and the personal, also the connections, the relationships that I, I got to uh, acquire here. It, it's beyond what I was expecting. Uh, from the professors, uh, from the educational uh, uh, point, it was fascinating. Uh, learning from each of these individuals that are just so dedicated in providing the highest quality. I, I, I can, thank you. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> forgive me. I'm just very grateful for every one of you. I'm just a little nervous. <laughs> um, but it was the best decision. It was, it was great. Just, uh, um, as Professor Treff said, right, it's not only the instruction, but the education, what matters. So every person that you uh, interact with, there is something that you get from them. So, and, well, it goes both ways. You get, but you must give. So that's how you become who you become. You have to um, move on through the challenges because you will find several challenges, no matter what you're doing. No matter where you are, no matter who you're speaking with, there is always going to be something that it's going to be a, a, um, the, the pebble in the shoe. There's going to be um, something that is going to make you uh, have a setback. But then the difference is how you handle those setbacks is what you do with those challenges. You can choose to just sit down or just lay down and cry all, all and feel miserable about yourself and the situation that you're going through. Or you can choose to learn from that experience. Okay, what is it? Instead of poor me, what is it that I need to learn from that situation? Because they, as a student, I have faced different challenges and every single opportunity, it has been, I had to make a choice. Okay, how do I handle this situation? It could be perhaps somebody misinformed you of, of, uh, of a process. Some, maybe that misinformation caused you to delay your graduation date or, or you couldn't take a class or you couldn't pass a test or anything. So it's never stop where if there is something that you feel that you did not get the right answer or that it doesn't feel right, you keep asking, you, you escalate, you go to different, different places and, and, and ask around and move forward, just move forward. Uh, one of the challenges um, besides the, the profession is juggling my life, personal life, family, business, with school. That was, that was a big deal. That was really, really tough at the beginning. But when you have your end goal, when you have your finish line on site, no matter what, no matter, no matter what you go through, you just keep your eyes on that finish line and you, you jump those hurdles. If nothing else, 
that you can take from all these stories that you have heard. I believe that is the, the, the main, the, the most important nugget that you may take with you. No matter what you face, no matter what your circumstances, no matter how people may make you feel a certain point, know who you are, know who you want to become, and keep your eyes on that finish line. Thank you. Thank you. And, and now before, before I move on to, to pass the, to the question and answer, I would like to ask the, the panel if uh, any, uh, and then based on the what just, uh, Carolyn just said about what helped her here in college, uh, I want to ask the panel first, have, have the privilege to do that first. To, so, uh, what sources, what sources and resources you find the college that uh, are, have been of help to you? Any anyone can, uh, or or perhaps from Rosa. To, to Caroline, what resources have you, f you found here helping you in college? Or uh, what do you wish the faculty at the college, the administrators know about uh, how to improve or how to change here in college to serve you better? If anyone. I don't know, from, from here over there? Or, or, or well, let me, let me begin well, with Sarah. Yeah, it works. Sarah? <laughs> Um, so one of the resources here at the college that really helped me out a lot, um, one of them was the club. So I didn't know that I actually wanted to be an engineer until I joined the Women in Technology Club. I always loved computers and the brother that did come with me to this country, he was an IT professional. So I, I was kind of familiar with that, but I never pictured myself as I guess uh, an engineer, technology, or anything in the science and mathematics fields. I always thought, you know, um, I always put myself down. I was like, oh, I'm a woman. I, I really can't do that. And then uh, when I joined, when I saw women in technology as a club, I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder what they do. And I went in there and I met a lovely group of women um, advisors and professionals that um, taught me there was so much to it. Um, and it's not just saying, oh, I'm a woman, or even um, with some other professions saying, oh, I'm a man, so I can't do that. Uh, it's not so much that if it's something that you have a passion for, you should pursue it. And so that's one of the resources. The other one is called LSAMP. So that's an acronym for Lewis Stokes Alliance for Minority Participation. So they do welcome uh, all sorts of minority groups, uh, Hispanics, Portuguese, um, and any, any sort of uh, minority group that you can think of. So uh, I joined them as well, and as a um, Latino woman, they said, well, you're definitely a minority. Not only that, but you're an engineer. Um, so just that alone, that puts you, uh, makes you eligible for that. So through LSAMP, I did various research opportunities as well as um, some travel and through some of the people that I met there, I, I ended up going to, um, I met a, I learned about the NCAS program. And what NCAS is, it's an opportunity to go um, to one of the NASA research facilities. So again, um, I never pictured myself doing this, but my instructors and professors, my advisors, they told me, hey, w why aren't you going for it? They kept recommending me to the program and I said, I. I really can't picture myself working at NASA or doing anything with them. That's not for me. Um, so I beat around the bush for a while until one day I happened to walk across the hallway. And this was just a week before the deadline. And I said, why? It's, it's an opportunity. My dad brought me here for an opportunity. And again, um, it, you only fail if you don't try. So I told myself, you know what? Here it goes. I applied for it. and. I ended up going to uh, the, Lang the NASA Langley Research Center down in Virginia. So that was another opportunity that I got, as well as tutoring, as I mentioned. I like math, but math and I have a love-hate relationship at this point. Um, I really like math, but it, for me, it's just very difficult to process it. So another thing, um, I go to the tutoring center a lot. I got a private tutor through the LSAMP program that I'm a part of, so that was another resource that I've used. Um, and that, that was about it. Um, well, not, not just for me, but for my brothers, the ESL program here at the school, 
um, the, the ladies here are part of. Um, ESL has helped my brothers a lot. They're actually, one of them just got a job as an engineer at a Marriott Hotel, and he's only been speaking English for two years. And the other one is working at a supermarket right now, but right now he's kind of getting a supervisor position. So through that ESL program, um, my whole family has succeeded a lot, and I would like to thank the college for that as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Kelly? Oh, Manuela? I have found great support from my advisor. She has always helped me to take the best decision for my learnings. Professors and tutors in the laboratory are always willing to help. In addition, we, we talk about situation of daily life. A tutor in particular has a lot of patience with me as I go very often to get help with uh, my writings and speakings. The library is also a great support. For me now, sometimes it's my second home. <laughs> and in, in general service, one person, the general service, who is in building B, is an example for me. He always does his work with joy. It's beautiful. Thank you. Anybody else? Carolyn, then? Oh, you want to? Lies? Yeah. So when I start to, to study in BCC, one of my, no, three, my three teachers understand Spanish. So if I know the meaning of the word, but I can say it in English, they say, okay, say it in Spanish. One of them is Diane, he is here. So thank you, Diane. For me, the library, the book of librarian has been uh, one of the greatest resources that we have um, here. Uh, especially, I remember Dr. Nato, uh, Professor Nato, he would say, it's like, oh, you and your pool of research, your pool of data, mm -hmm. you love to swim in. So that has been a fabulous, uh, the libra librarians here are amazing. They're really a good point to start if you don't know where to start when you have any, any paper that you need to, to do. That's a good point uh, there. Uh, I have to say thank you to Livia because the first day who I came here, she helped me not only about my education, she helped me about emotional and it's everything. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> and and there well, let me open then to the, the floor to the to the public, to the audience. Any questions you want to ask the, the panelists? <laughs> well, because I have more questions here, okay? So, for instance, you tell the good things, the nice things, but what things can, be, can we improve here at the college? What can we do different to serve you better as Hispanic, Latina, female students? Notice those adjectives make sense, all of them, okay? Hispanic, Latino, female students, because we have different uh, needs, different uh, approach to the world. Well, now you Anything? got me talking, Professor, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, there we all, you know, from, from each one of us, we always have uh, areas that we can improve. If there were two things, uh, well, where do I start? Information, I would say information uh, from the staff. It's perhaps one of the most crucial uh, aspects that can be improved. I did experience a couple of the challenges had to do with information. When I first started the program, I just went into the class uh, and uh, I was not aware that I needed to take a test in order to be in the program. 
So after I registered, I was advised that I needed to take the test, otherwise I couldn't be in the program. That was one thing. I was like, all right. So that was, that was a challenge that was navigated and successfully uh, passed. And uh, another one that was more recent was during uh, a registration, during a direct study application, where a process that uh, was supposed to take two weeks, it took two months after several, and after several uh, follow-ups, I finally received a, a denied answer. Because that was denied, uh, I was because of the time frame and how everything, the communications went, I had the feeling that there was no due diligence really in, in, in this process that was not really reviewed. And uh, I went, we, we worked it out. I, I went to Professor Triff and asked, uh, he, he helped me during the process as well to clarify that I did meet the requirements to, for that direct study. And uh, we successfully, I was successfully uh, able to do the semester, although a little bit short. It was just like six weeks because of the, all that delayed. But it was, it was done. So with this is when you receive an information that doesn't, doesn't seem quite right, don't stop right there. If somebody denies you of, of something, and it could be here at uh, uh, Bristol Community College, it could be at work, it could be anywhere where you are. When you receive a denial, you want to be informed of what are the reasons for that denial and uh, that those reasons may be valid. And that know that you always, well, most of the time, I believe that you may have a chance to appeal whatever decision has been made, has been given. So again, going back to don't give, ever give up and uh, just keep on asking. But uh, those information would be the main thing that would be a thing. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? What can we do to improve college? Yes, Manuel. I would like BCC to invest in putting more signs and guidelines in different languages. And I have people who master several languages in the most important office, for example, admission, accounting, and others. Because BCC serves international students. I remember my first day in class, one exercise with the teacher. She sent to search different buildings, and <laughs> I am real lost because I know English. What is this sign? What? Oh my goodness! When I was in my house, I love crying because I think, oh, this is not possible for me. Now it's important, now I, I go to the different places, but for the students, it's difficult. The science is only in English, um, but now it's, uh, in my group is uh, 18 nations inside the class. It's a lot of different nations. This is very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Well, somebody else from the, I gave you a chance, but you have a chance now to, I mean, to think of the questions. Yes? Is it hard to, uh, oh, sorry. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Is it hard to keep in touch with your family? And do you have cultural differences now that you've been in the United States? Do they say things that you forgot about that don't make sense? Oh, can you repeat that? Sure. Is it hard to uh, keep in touch with your family that's in, you know, Colombia, Dominican Republic, and do you have cultural differences when you're talking with them, things you don't understand because you've been away from that country? So in the beginning, 
Uh, I don't know what it was like before, but um, for me, like around 2005, that's where internet was very prominent. So we had Messenger. Um, it seems like so long ago since I last used it, um, but Messenger, and then once things like Facebook came around, uh, WhatsApp. So we we keep in touch constantly. Um, I'd say. Uh, as far as there being communication and making sure that we know uh, what events, what's happening in our lives, uh, it's not very difficult to keep up. But where it can get really difficult, uh, in my situation, I don't know if it's the same for everyone else or for other cultures. Um, like for example, my grandfather passed away um, last summer and plane tickets are so expensive, um, especially depending on the times of the years, but that was summertime um, and they can get up to like $2,000. Uh, for me to fly to Colombia, so it, it's been a weird pattern of I get to fly every three years to see my family. Um, last year was an exception because my brother ended up getting married, so we went back in 2016. I thought I was going to go back in 2019. Um, turned out to be I ended up going back in 2017. So um, there is um, connection in talking, but as far as really getting that physical connection and really being able to hug my brothers when they were in Colombia, hug my mother, um, be with my grandma or do any of those things. I think that's where it gets very difficult. And um, I, I'm trying to think about the second question that you had. Cultural differences. They say something. Yeah, so um, with cultural differences, so I, I remember the language. I remember how to write in Spanish. And I remember some things about my culture. I'm what you call, there's a new term now called a 1.5 generation. So that you have first gen, then you have your 1.5 generation. So you are come here young enough to remember the culture, to keep that culture in you. Um, like I still remember how to dance from when I was eight years old, how they taught me um, um, all, all sorts of different things, like the language, how to cook the food. But when I go back, um, people notice that I'm not Colombian in their standards. They can tell that I'm not from there. And it's, and it's not because of looks, because um, you'd be surprised in Colombia, there's a whole hodgepodge of what a Colombian looks like. So it's not looks at all. Uh, it's from how I portray myself. Um, I, I would say for a woman, I'm, I'm exceptionally confident now. So they notice that down there too. Um, and they also notice in, in Colombia, when you go there, it's a very friendly, very open culture. You make eye contact when you walk. Um, it's very welcoming, heartwarming. So when I, when I first went there, um, it, it made me aware that I wasn't really making eye contact with people when I was there. So that was one thing that they noticed, how uh, instead of um, letting them hug me and do the cheek-to-cheek -cheek kiss, I was very, here's a handshake. So th it's like little stuff like that. Um, that they start to notice. And in my family in particular, I think um, the hardest thing now is um, not so much with my immediate family, like my brothers, um, my father, my mom, or my grandma, but with um, extended family, like cousins and uncles. Once you come to the United States, there's this um, perception that you suddenly have everything. So um, you're no longer, uh, you could say you're no longer, they don't see that you're at the level at that point. They see you as a resource. So they're constantly asking, could you take me there? Could you get me this? Can you give me money? So there's that disconnect from my extended family now. Um, whereas my closest family, they understand the hardships, that it's not very easy. But as far as extended family or even people from that village, they would say, oh, hey, there's the American girl. And that's where the cultural differences come in. Yes. I have a similar uh, in regards to the culture, and uh, especially in the way I speak now, not not in English but it, in Spanish, it's a more direct, a more I'm going to the point. So there is that has been a shock with my family because I just say it as it is, and in, in our culture, in, in I am I have become more sensitive about that uh, that. I need to just to be more, yes, yeah, more sensitive, but more uh, aware of how the context when we're speaking and how, how um, 
we like to tell stories before we tell what it is, right? So we need to navigate people. So that was that has been probably the 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 most uh, shocking uh, that in the IST here in the United States. I still can't get over that <laughs> cultural shock. Uh, and, and with the connections, the communication with the families, it's, uh, as uh, Sarah, uh, it's, you know, you're always in touch some, some way and, and keeping up thanks to technology. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think this is a, we don't have more time for, for more questions, so please uh, welcome them again. Let me have a round of applause to our pa great panel today. And thank you, all of you, for being so brave. Thank you so very much, everyone, for being here. Thank you for your questions. Thank you so much to our panelists for being so brave and, and um, being so open and wanting to share a little bit of your experiences with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you.